uh, talk a little bit about today about the uh, Hubble Space uh, Telescope. And uh, this week is a uh, milestone week for, for the telescope. Uh, it is the 30th anniversary for, for the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it's amazing to think that this uh, telescope has been uh, in space for 30 years, a long time for a spacecraft. Uh, during this time, the Hubble has become one of the most famous and productive telescopes in history that has ever existed. Uh, it's performed more than a million and a half observations and produced more than 15,000 uh, 15, scientific papers based on the data that's come down. So pretty amazing record. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the, this telescope and a little bit of the history. Uh, if we could go to the next uh, slide, please. We'll talk about uh, on the uh, uh, left-hand side, you'll see Edwin Hubble, um, that the telescope is named for him. He played a crucial role in figuring out the size of the universe. Before 1925, no one really knew how big the universe was. But the people just thought that the Milky Way galaxy was everything. It was the whole universe. But he was able to prove that our galaxy, the Milky Way, is only one of many galaxies out there in the universe. And so he went on to discover that these galaxies are all moving away from us because the universe is expanding. And so very groundbreaking work that he did back in the 20th century. Uh, on the right hand side, we have a little New Jersey connection here. This is Lyman Spitzer, a very well known astronomer. Uh, he worked at Princeton University right here in New Jersey. And he was the first person to propose the idea of putting a large telescope in space way back in 1946. And so he was the driving force behind developing this, uh, this project. And so he's known as the father of the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, if we go to the, uh, the next slide, uh, if uh, uh, Lyman Spitzer uh, was the father, well, we should mention the Hubble Space Telescope's mother. Uh, this is Nancy Grace Roman, and she was the chief of astronomy at NASA, one of the first, I think the first woman to hold an executive position at NASA, and she oversaw the planning and development of the Hubble Space Telescope. So thanks to these two people, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope came, came to fruition. So let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, the launch, you know, 30 years ago this week, April 24th, 1990, the, shuttle, uh, the Space Shuttle Discovery was launched carrying the uh, telescope into space. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see the uh, space telescope being deployed out of the payload bay of the space shuttle. And uh, this is a, a fairly large uh, spacecraft. Uh, the mirror for the Hubble Space Telescope is about 95 inches in diameter, which is actually not that large compared to other telescopes here on the ground, but some of which are three to 400 inches in diameter. So the Hubble's great advantage is not in its size, but its location. You know, it is about 350 miles above the atmosphere, above the clouds, above the smog, and that sort of thing, above the turbulence. And so this gives it an incredibly clear view of the universe. So let's take a look. I've got a, a couple of slides here that I can show you that it's the, the Hubble's greatest hits. And so let's start out with one of the, perhaps one of the most famous images, and this is a, a portion of the Eagle Nebula, and it's known as the Pillars of Creation. And so Pillars of Creation is a very appropriate description. Uh, we've long known that stars are born in these big clouds of gas and dust called nebulas. Uh, but um, uh, this particular, uh, uh, these types of images uh, helps us to understand how this uh, process happens. And so you have these big long uh, fingers of gas and dust uh, sticking out here, and in, these are in the process of forming stars inside of them. And if you look carefully, you may notice that there are wisps of gas coming off of this nebula, and that's because there are nearby stars and the light and the radiation from the stars are kind of eroding away the nebula and those wisps are kind of, kind of wafting off into, into space. And so really a very beautiful image of this process of, of star formation. Now, uh, let's go on to the next image. Uh, this is one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorites from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called NGC 3603. And uh, this is one of the biggest clouds of glowing gas that we have in our Milky Way. And you've got this big star cluster right in the middle of it. And this, uh, 
is something that's very common. Uh, stars seem to form in clusters like this uh, all the time. And uh, this one is producing so many stars that it's called a starburst region. Very, very beautiful to look at. Uh, let's go on to the next, another kind of similar uh, situation here. This is uh, Westerland 2. Uh, this is a similar massive star cluster and, and huge nebula, another gorgeous image of star cluster that is very young, only perhaps about 2 million years old. And you can see this kind of curious star formation that's occurring here. So the galaxy is a very uh, active place and we're learning more about it uh, all the time. Uh, if we go on to the next uh, image, we've got a wide field view of the Carina Nebula. This is kind of a massive mural uh, made with Hubble Space Telescope images. Uh, it's located in the, in the southern hemisphere. It contains massive stars and clusters of stars and knots of, of gas uh, all around it. And you'll notice near the center of the image, you've got some clusters of stars in here. And these young stars are pouring out so much light and radiation, they're pushing back against the gas. And you can see this kind of big bubble, if you look carefully, you see this big bubble around them and they're pressing around the gases. And uh, there's star formation taking place uh, in the, these uh, lumps of gas. And so let's take a closer look. We're gonna zoom in, see this little area here, this little blob. We're gonna zoom into that and take a look at that close, I've got a close-up view of this area. And so let's zoom in, next uh, image. Here's a very uh, bizarre looking object here that astronomers like to call the Mystic Mountain. And it does look really uh, mysterious. Uh, it's a towering uh, mass of gas about three light years high. Uh, it, there's a, a lot of massive star formation occurring here. And it's pretty spectacular. You can see these jets. Uh, there are young stars being born right here, right now, uh, the young stars are forming and there's jets of gas coming out of these young stars. And you can see some of these uh, jets, a really spectacular image of the star formation. The clouds are collapsing here and forming new stars uh, even as we speak. So really a beautiful image uh, there. Uh, now let's uh, go on to the, uh, the next uh, image here. Uh, not only can we learn about the birth of stars, we have used the Hubble to learn more about how planets form. And so here we have the, in the background, you see the famous Orion Nebula, a very popular object with amateur astronomers. It's still visible in the nighttime sky right now, just after sunset. And in this nebula, we've discovered that there are more than 200 young stars in this nebula that have these disks uh, of gas around them. So you see these little disks all around them. And this is the uh, sign of planet formation. There's the disk of gas that will collapse and start to form planets. So these are future solar systems that we're looking at. So uh, we've learned quite a bit uh, about that as well. Um, speaking of planets, if we go on to the next slide, uh, we have been finding many planets orbiting around nearby stars, and we call them exoplanets. They're uh, beyond the sun, and so they're called exoplanets. Uh, this is an artist's rendition of what an exoplanet named, well, named only K218b. It doesn't have a real name, just a catalog number. Uh, K2, uh, what it might look like here. Uh, it's about eight times more massive than the Earth. And uh, although it's at a habitable distance from its star, it probably isn't Earth-like. It's more like a smaller version of Neptune. And what's important about this particular planet is that Hubble detected water vapor in its atmosphere the ver for the very first time. So we're starting to not only find these planets, we're starting to learn a little bit more about their atmospheres. And so that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, if we want to learn more about the atmospheres and surfaces of these exoplanets, we need to build a larger space telescope, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. But uh, let's uh, move on and take a look at another type of nebula. Uh, nebulas can also teach us a great deal about the deaths of stars. We learn a lot about the, the, the births, we can learn about their deaths. Here's the beautiful butterfly nebula, another favorite image of mine. Uh, this is uh, what happens when a star like the sun reaches the end of its life. Uh, when it runs out of fuel uh, in, after billions of years, it turns into a red giant star and then puffs off its outer layers of gas and this 
creates some pretty beautiful looking nebulas in all kinds of different shapes. And so we have another example. If you go forward, we go forward one more image. Uh, we can see the famous cat's eye. And so uh, this is, uh, really does look like an, an eye. And uh, these nebulas, by the way, are called planetary nebula. And uh, that's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with uh, planets, but they are very important for understanding the life uh, of a star. And our own sun will end billions of years from now as a planetary nebula. Maybe it would look something like the cat's eye or the butterfly uh, nebula. So, um, the Rokars are larger stars. Let's find out what happens to the larger stars in the universe. Go forward one more to the next image, and here we have the famous Crab Nebula. Uh, even larger stars have a different fate. Uh, they collapse at the end of their lives and they explode. They go supernova. And supernovas are somewhat rare, but we can learn about them by looking at objects like the Crab Nebula. We call this a supernova remnant. Uh, this is leftover gas ejected uh, by the star that uh, exploded about a thousand years ago. It was witnessed uh, here on Earth. And uh, what's left behind is a neutron star. If you look down towards the center of the cloud, down inside of there, there's a, a neutron star, something that is a super dense uh, core of a star is all that's, uh, that's left. Uh, for stars, the biggest stars that there are, uh, they go even further. Uh, the largest uh, uh, stars, will their gravity is so intense that they form black holes. And so that's another really important discovery from Hubble is that most galaxies have these supermassive black holes at their centers, at their core. Uh, the largest black holes we've found can be anywhere between 20 and 40 billion times more massive than the sun. And so let's take a look at some of these uh, galaxies. Uh, if we go forward to the next slide, we've got the famous Whirlpool Galaxy, another popular amateur astronomer object. Uh, now we're looking outside of our galaxies. The previous objects were thousands of light years away. Uh, now we are looking at something that is millions, 23 million light years away. Uh, this is somewhere near the, the Big Dipper's handle. It's a great example of interacting galax an interacting galaxy. And we can learn a lot about galaxies looking at this. Uh, we can see gas and uh, pink, these pink gases, mostly hydrogen, all spread out along the spiral arms, as, long with, as, long with this, as well as the dark lanes of dust and, and gas. And we can see a furious amount of star formation because of this galaxy off to the side on the right, that's a smaller galaxy that has passed through the whirlpool. And that's what's creating all this furious star formation. So if we go to the next slide, we can see some examples of this. We see a lot of examples around this in the universe. These are all interacting, colliding galaxies. These are kind of these car crashes that are in, in progress. And this is a very important part of the formation of galaxies. Galaxies are formed by mergers like this. Your own Milky Way formed through many of these mergers over billions of years. And let me show you a spectacular example, another favorite image of mine. If you go forward to the next uh, galaxy here, simply known as ARP273, it's known as the Galactic Rose because it looks like a beautiful flower out there in space. And so a very beautiful view uh, of this interacting galaxy. And uh, finally, let's go to uh, another shot here uh, of the Hubble that's very, very important uh, uh, to uh, astronomy and to science. This is the, one of the Hubble ultra deep fields. And so this particular image you're looking at contains about 10,000 galaxies going back all the way to within a few hundred million years of the Big Bang. And, uh, so everything you see, every teeny tiny dot that you see here is a galaxy, except for the one on the lower right is a foreground star. And so using the Hubble Space Telescope, we're finally able to measure the age of the universe. It's 13.8 billion years old, and uh, astronomers are able to measure the expansion and very surprisingly have fa found that it's accelerating. The expansion is getting faster. It's speeding up due to dark energy, mysterious dark energy in the universe, which is not really fully understood. understood. And so in a nutshell, there's some of Hubble's greatest hits over the last 30 years. So let's go forward one more here. Uh, 
the, here's the space telescope, uh, probably for its last servicing mission. That's one reason for the space telescope's uh, longevity. Uh, how it's been able to survive for 30 years is it can be upgraded and repaired. And uh, Mary Hiller and I were very fortunate to see this launch. The space shuttle launched in 2009 to carry uh, equipment up to the space telescope and do repairs and the spacecraft is still healthy and um, will operate for hopefully for many more years. Uh, but uh, let's finish on uh, the next uh, slide here. Uh, this is what's going to be hopefully launching next year, a bigger space telescope. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, and this will extend what the Hubble Space Telescope has learned. In order to reach the furthest uh, parts of the universe, we need to have the bigger telescope, we need to look into the infrared part of the spectrum, and that's what the James Webb Space Telescope is designed to do. The mirror is about 21 feet in diameter, almost the size of our planetarium at the museum, about two and a half times larger than the Hubble one. So hopefully if this uh, all goes well, it will launch just about a year from now. So something to look forward. And during that time, both the Hubble and the James Webb Telescope will operate together uh, to explore the universe. And so a very exciting time uh, in astronomy. And so I uh, hope you uh, uh, stop this week to think about all the, the wonderful things that the Space Telescope has discovered. And take a look at some of those images. You have to come to the uh, NASA website, or if you look at the Hubble site, uh, hubblesite.org has a big gallery of all kinds of images, beautiful images of the universe. And so take some time to look at those uh, this week and wish uh, the Space Telescope a happy 30th birthday. And uh, so I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Um, I don't know if we have any uh, questions uh, from the audience at this point. We could take some uh, questions. We do have some questions from the audience. Uh, Keisha wants to know, what is the diameter, and you might have mentioned it earlier, the diameter sure. of the Hubble telescope? Yeah, it's about about 95 inches, uh, which is uh, pretty big, a good sized telescope, but in terms of, um, as far as telescopes goes these days, it's actually not that big. Uh, Edwin Hubble, in fact, uh, made a lot of his discoveries using the biggest telescope in the world in the 1920s. And what was the size of that telescope? About 100 inches. So this telescope yeah. is not very big compared to modern telescopes, which as I mentioned, some of them are 400 inches in diameter now, uh, the ones on the ground anyway. And so uh, really huge, gigantic telescopes and in fact, they're uh, planning to build a telescope that is 30 meters in diameter, even larger, and so gigantic telescopes. And so those can do an amazing amount of work, but we still think we need uh, space telescopes in order to reach the furthest parts of the universe. Uh, that's where the James Webb uh, comes in. So, yeah, right. good question. Uh, Kevin, you mentioned that the last servicing mission was in 2009? In 2009, yeah. yeah 2009. How often? How often did the Hubble telescope, uh, would it get serviced? Um, I think I kind of lost track, but there were four or five in that, during that time period, uh, there were four or five uh, missions. I kind of lost track, but uh, uh, there were four or five uh, service missions during that time. And they were kind of irregular. Uh, they kind of, uh, there wasn't a regular schedule. They just went up when they needed to and, and when instruments were ready for, to be flown. Uh, those were planned in advance. Now, some people ask, have asked, uh, well, could we service the space telescope again? Uh, it's possible, but without the space shuttle, since the space shuttle isn't flying anymore, it's a little bit more difficult. I mean, they did set up, uh, during the last service mission, set up a docking port so that, at the very least, uh, NASA could send up something to dock with the spacecraft and deorbit it. Because it's a massive object, that huge mirror, you can't just let that fall into the atmosphere and tumble and land in somebody's backyard. And so you have to right. control the descent. And uh, the original plan was to retrieve it, to send the space telescope up to bring it back. But that's not possible at this point. And so uh, at least there is an option uh, now. There's no plans to do any refurbishment at this point. They're putting more effort into the James Webb's the telescope at this point. Okay. Um, someone wants to know how many, about how many images has the Hubble telescope taken? Gosh, um, uh, a lot. Um, I mean, as I said, I believe there's been uh, roughly 1.5 million observations. Wow. And not all of those are images, so a lot of, some of that is just data, so you're just getting, getting back numbers and information from instruments. So they're not all images. So I would say off the top of my head, 
probably several hundred thousand images have been uh, downloaded, you know. Um, another question from Francis, uh, will the Webb uh, telescope be the same distance from the Earth as Hubble? Yeah, good question. No. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, as I mentioned, is infrared. So we're looking for basically the wavelengths of heat. Uh, and in order to be able to detect the faintest objects in the universe, you're going to have to make your telescope cold. It's got to be as cool as possible. And so we can't have that telescope near the Earth. The Earth is too warm uh, and uh, you know, you've got other things you know, happening, but you need to extend the distance. And so basically, the Hubble, sorry, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be about a million miles away from the Earth. Uh, it's going to be at a point which they call L2, uh, which is a balancing point between the gravity of the Earth and the Sun. It's about a million miles away. And so it'll be sitting at that little station there and looking at the universe. And if you recall the image that I showed you of the telescope, it's got a big sun shield on it. That's got to be probably something like 60 or 70 feet long. And that shield will keep the mirror and the instruments as cool as possible. And so uh, it will be out there. And so basically, if there's any servicing needed for that telescope, it's a much more difficult project uh, to uh, service. There are actually no plans to right. service that instrument, but uh, it perhaps could be done if there's some kind of emergency, I suppose. Okay. Uh, Francis also would like to know, when Hubble was conceived, did they think that it would last this long? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, certainly they thought because it was serviceable, they knew that it would last a fairly long time. But uh, uh, certainly I think they thought the James Webb telescope would fly sooner. That's had a lot of delays. It's a very complicated piece of equipment. Was the projection for this year? No, no. Yeah, I, I don't recall uh, offhand what the original end of life was thought it was going to be, but they knew it would last for, for quite a long time. Uh, but with the delays of the James Webb telescope, uh, that, yeah, its life has been extended. Uh, they do usually do it in five-year chunks, and I think we're reaching the end of the last chunk in 2021, and so they're expecting it'll be extended for another five years at, at least, and perhaps could be, if we're lucky, could keep operating even longer than that. Uh, Kevin, does the telescope take pictures of space waste? Tatiana wants to know. Space waste, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure what that means. By that, I mean, if you mean um, space junk, for example, just you know, how we refer to as stuff Maybe, that yeah. is orbiting around the earth. And that's a, a really bad situation where you know, we've got a lot of debris from launches that took place in the past, uh, and it could be anything from flakes of paint off of a spacecraft or bolts and parts and things like that are floating around, and there's thousands and thousands of pieces of space junk orbiting around the Earth, unfortunately. And that's a big problem and could be an even greater problem in the future. Uh, but the space telescope can't really image something like that. It's kind of too close in a way uh, to focus on that sort of thing. Uh, certainly we can look out into space and we can see all kinds of stuff, all kinds of things that are out there in the solar system and out there in the universe. You can see all kinds of gas and debris from uh, supernovas and things like that. So you can see a lot of stuff out there in the universe, but not really space junk. We use equipment down here on the ground uh, to track space junk. All right. I think I have a few more about Hubble. Can Hubble actually take photos of exoplanets? And will the new telescope be able to do the same? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the Hubble Space Telescope can take pictures of uh, exoplanets, but not very good ones. I mean, the telescope I was mentioned is only 90, 95 inches in diameter, and it can see a little bit into the infrared, and so that helps. And it has done, uh, has taken a couple of images of nearby stars. There's a, um, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about exoplanets, because I know someone had a question about it, but um, there's a star uh, called Beta Pictoris, which I believe they've actually imaged uh, a planet there, uh, but it appears as a little dot. And they've actually, as I mentioned, the, uh, the Kepler, the K2 planet, uh, we measured uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, but in order to see more of the atmosphere, if you want to know about the surfaces, 
we really need an infrared, a telescope that does see deeper into the infrared and the telescope needs to be bigger. And that's the role of the James Webb Space Telescope. So that's gonna be a big part of uh, the JWST as it's called for short. Uh, that's a big part of its mission is looking for and more exoplanets. So good question. Okay. Well, that's a great segue to Kay's question. Uh, how big can an exoplanet be? They can be pretty big. Um, I, I'm not sure what the biggest one we've found so far, but you easily get into the range of planets that are a dozen times bigger than Jupiter, you know, uh, which is massive. Uh, wow. It can, and we know, and theoretically, we know they can even be bigger than that, uh, quite, quite large. Um, anything under, if I, uh, if I remember correctly, anything under 100 Jupiters is considered a gas giant uh, planet. And you get over that, we get more than that. Well, then you're talking about dwarf stars and, and brown dwarfs and things like that, but uh, it gets a little more complicated, but uh, anything up to 100 Jupiters is considered, anything under 100 Jupiters, I should say, you consider it a big, really, really big gas giant planet. Kevin, um, Jen wants to know who is or was James Webb? Oh, good question. James Webb uh, was the administrator of NASA during the Apollo program. And so uh, he was not, uh, if I remember correctly, he was not a rocket scientist or anything like that, uh, but he was just a really, really good administrator. He guided the, uh, NASA through a very intense period of both manned and unmanned uh, spacecraft going out into the, the solar system and exploring space. And so it was very important to NASA. And so that's how it got named uh, after him. I have a few about stars. So sure. segueing a little bit away from Hubble, how many stars are there in the sky? How many stars are there uh, in the sky? Um, if you uh, think about the whole sky, the whole 360 degrees of the sky, you're talking about five or 6,000 stars that are visible to the naked eye. Uh, but you rarely get to see that much. The sky is really dark enough these days in order to see that many stars. And of course, you know, depending on where you live, you only get to see uh, about half the sky. Uh, so you're really talking how many could you see from, let's say, here in New Jersey, a maximum number would probably be around 3,000. It's about half of the, the stars in the sky. And the further away you get from the cities, the less light pollution there is, the easier it is to see more stars. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we have a lot of problems with light pollution uh, here in yes. New Jersey. And yes, uh, yes. it really is um, pollution. You're wasting a lot of energy just pouring your way up in the sky. Ruins, ruins our view of the sky. It's really quite a uh, sad situation. Uh, uh, good topic for Earth Day. You know, not only are we polluting the Earth, we're polluting the sky as well. It's not a good thing. So I would like to know, um, how long does a star live? It depends. It depends. Um, some of the really, really big stars, some of them are hundreds of times more massive than our own sun. And those really big stars actually have very short lives, which is kind of counterintuitive. But the really massive stars, they burn their fuel quicker. And so they go through it really fast. Some of the biggest stars in the universe only live for a few million years, maybe several million years. And they, they go supernova. They, they, they run out of fuel to burn very quickly. Um, small stars, the smallest little red dwarf stars, those last a long time. Those can last for billions and billions of years because they're burning their, their fuel real slow. Um, the sun, uh, sun-like stars were a medium-sized star, um, like about 10 billion years. And we're about halfway through right now, halfway through the sun's life. So another 5 billion years to go. Before All right, everyone, but five, five billion years is still a long time for us. A long time, it is, <laughs> yes. You, you, can't, you can't even write that on your calendar, so don't this worry about that. This is true. <laughs> so don't, be don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Yeah. Um, I forgot one, Kevin, about yes. the Hubble telescope. Is sure. uh, oh, yeah. What is the most important discovery uh, that Hubble telescope made about the beginning of the universe? Well, certainly the, um, the age. I mean, people didn't really know. They had a rough idea that the universe was 10 to 20 billion years old. Uh, 
but we really needed more information and the Hubble provided that, uh, measuring the distances to galaxies, measuring the distances to supernovas that were occurring in those galaxies, and we were able to calculate uh, that the universe is really 13.8 billion years old. And so that's a pretty uh, amazing uh, discovery. Uh, a lot of the, the other things that we know about the early universe, uh, that actually comes more of, not from astronomy, but more from particle physics, from, which is very ironic in a way that sometimes we can learn about the universe by looking at the smallest things in the universe, looking at particles and how they interact in particle accelerators and atom smashers and things like that, you know. So we've discovered about the origins of the universe using multiple different uh, types of uh, information. Radio telescopes are really very important for studying the background radiation. And microwave uh, telescopes are uh, very important for understanding the background radiation coming from uh, the Big Bang. And so all of those things together have helped us learn about the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. Thank you, Kevin. I have a few more about stars. Um, how big are stars? Uh, re some of them are really, really large. Um, most stars actually though, if you think of in terms of numbers, most stars are really quite small. The most common stars in the universe are red dwarfs. Uh, they're really small. Uh, they're say, what, about tenth of, a tenth of the size of the sun. And uh, you find them everywhere, all around us. And so they are the most common stars. And then you have medium stars like the sun. Those are a little bit more rare, but still you do find quite a lot of them. Uh, the rarest of all stars are the really, really big ones. And those, yeah, those can be hundreds of times more massive than the sun. And um, in some cases, some of the biggest of the red giants, the red supergiant stars, uh, if you took a red giant star, supergiant, and stuck it into our solar system, the surface of the star would almost reach the orbit of Jupiter. And so really quite amazing how big uh, some of these stars are and how bright they are too. Um, Tinu wants to know why when we look up at the sky sometimes, do we see animal figures in them? Uh, well, uh, that mostly uh, has to do with uh, with us. <laughs> you know, uh, human beings, we are always looking for patterns. And uh, just like uh, when you were a kid, uh, lying back and looking at clouds and imagining different uh, shapes up in the clouds, that's the same idea. You know, we see these random patterns and patterns of stars, and we like to make them into pictures. And we've been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. A lot of these constellations that we use today go back thousands of years and different cultures had different constellations. There were you know, obviously someone uh, who lives uh, in Northern Canada is not going to imagine an elephant in the sky. They've never seen one. So, um, you know, it all depends on what your local uh, experience is and your culture is. And uh, so different peoples have different constellations. It's really a fascinating topic. You know, and, and when we're back at the museum, uh, I invite everyone to come and visit our planetarium because we have so many great shows that talk about this tradition of storytelling, right? So it's very cultural. So depending on where you're from, uh, your background, the stories you tell, your traditions, you'll see something else. So keep that in mind. Um, Mei Ling wants to know about how many constellations are in there in the sky. Ah, good question. An easy way to remember it uh, is to think about a piano. If, you know, if you've ever played the piano, uh, how many keys are on a piano? Uh, 88 keys on a piano. And it just ha so happens, just by chance, that there are 88 constellations in the whole sky. And as I said earlier, you know, we are, here in New Jersey, we only can see about half the sky. So we can see about 40 uh, of the 40, 41 of those constellations are visible from here in New Jersey. Uh, Kevin, oh, someone else just sent another Hubble-related question. Okay. How did the Hubble spacecraft make it past asteroids and space debris without any significant damage? Also, hold on, let me see. Also, maybe it was asked, my phone dropped from the video conference. Ah. Uh, You'll be able, if you fell out of the conference and you oh, haven't yeah. been on the webinar, this is being recorded. So it'll be on loop on Facebook. Uh, so you can find it there again. 
All right, but back to the Hubble one. Yeah, yeah. How did it make it past asteroids and space debris? Well, um, for the first part, I would say it didn't <laughs> because remember that the Hubble Space Telescope is only about 350 miles above the surface of the Earth. It's in a relatively uh, low Earth orbit. And so it's 350 miles above the, the surface. Uh, so uh, that's where it is. Uh, it's located in orbit around the Earth. And so the asteroid belt, of course, is obviously way out beyond the orbit of Mars. And so you don't need to cross the asteroid belt to get up into the low Earth orbit. But yes, of course, as we mentioned just a, a moment ago, that uh, there is a lot of space junk in orbit uh, around the Earth. And that is unfortunate, and it can be a danger for spacecraft. I mean, it certainly has a danger for the International Space Station, which uh, is orbiting a little bit lower, about 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. And the space shuttle, uh, on occasion, has been hit. Um, I think they've got a chip in a, in, a, in a window, I think, or at one of the missions. It's really scary. Uh, but, um, you know, we are able to track. Uh, the the uh, Air Force has a program where they uh, track uh, the space debris, the bigger chunks of space debris, and so we are able to avoid it. Uh, and if you see the possibility of a collision, you can uh, uh, hopefully avoid that. Actually, well, the Hubble Space Telescope, you can't really move, you can't really change the orbit, it doesn't have engines. It's just in a, sitting in a stable orbit, uh, so you can't really move the Space Telescope. But on occasion, uh, the space that has been kind of putting put into sleep mode, so to speak. And they close the, the hatch on the front and they turn the spacecraft away from uh, the danger and hopefully that will help uh, prevent uh, any damage. And so it's a concern, but uh, you know, we've so, so far that nothing terrible has happened to the Hubble Space Telescope in 30 years. So they've been doing a pretty right. good job. Kevin, does it take moving images, the Hubble telescope, and also is its storage space capacity for images limited? And how do the images get back to Earth? Um, you can't do moving images. You, you can't do videos, uh, though you can take a series of images and you kind of stack them up and make little animations. And certainly uh, that has been done with things like asteroids and other types of uh, things when observing planets here in the solar system, uh, there are some uh, small uh, animations uh, of images, but it, yeah, it really can't do a video and uh, kind of tough for the space telescope in terms of storage if you, because videos take up a lot of space, uh, they take a lot of bandwidth trying to move them down to, to Earth. So they don't really do too much in the way of uh, video. Um, yeah, in storage space, I don't uh, recall how much storage space is on the space telescope. That's a good question. Uh, but they can hold a fair amount in the telescope. But, uh, you know, there are ground stations all over the world that NASA uses. It's called the Deep Space Network. Uh, and you can download those, uh, those, that information regularly. And I'm sure that they do download regularly just in case something goes wrong. They don't want to lose any data that they've taken. And so that's done on a regular basis. And so storage is not too much of an issue. They, they download that pretty quickly. Kevin, I think we have time for two more questions. And I kind of want to wrap up today's session with advice for young astronomers. Right now, especially since we have all of this time, uh, since we're all home, it's a great opportunity to start up and pick up a new, uh, a new hobby. And one of the things I used to love to do as a kid was look up at the moon. And I remember doing that with a telescope that I purchased at Toys R Us. So <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give to young astronomers and what type of telescope would you recommend for beginners? Sure, yeah, uh, that's a common question at the, the planetarium. And uh, getting a, uh, a small telescope is uh, perhaps not quite as expensive as you might think. Uh, you know, the best type that we always try to recommend for beginners uh, is uh, to buy what's called a Dobsonian telescope. And uh, this is basically the, the, the optics themselves are uh, kind of a standard Newtonian design and something that Isaac Newton came up with in the 17th century. And that design has been around for centuries and it's really a, a good design, uh, very easy to, to make. And uh, it's uh, 
inexpensive to inexpensive to manufacture, and so. Um, uh, uh, a good type of telescope is a Dobsonian. And it kind of, you can recognize them because they kind of look like cannons, like little cannons. And uh, so here's a, a good example uh, called a star blast, about four and a half inches uh, in diameter. And, uh, you know, it's got good optics and uh, it's very portable. You can pick this up and carry it out into the backyard and go take a look at the moon or a planet or a star cluster if you know where, where to look. And so it's a very good uh, type of design. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, uh, there's another version of it. Uh, it's kind of a uh, more compact version, a collap collapsing telescope called the One Sky, a One Sky telescope uh, that's offered by a, an organization called Astronomy, Astronomers Without Borders. And so this is a really nice telescope and it's a great cause. You know, everyone you purchase can organization gets a donation. And uh, so very nice little telescopes are very compact and portable and they have good optics on them. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, here's a larger version. Uh, this I think is probably an eight inch version of a Dobsonian. So you get a, a six inch or eight inch size. That's a pretty good decent uh, size. So you can see quite a few uh, things uh, in the nighttime sky with, with an object uh, sort of with a telescope this uh, size. And they're not that expensive. Uh, let's say an eight inch version of this telescope, you might be able to get for say four or $500. And so it's not that expensive. Uh, and uh, what you have to include as you're, if you're considering buying a telescope like this, you do have to consider to you need, you need a couple of accessories uh, with uh, this telescope. Uh, you need some kind of a, a finder scope. Uh, the finder scope helps you find things and uh, that's very important. If you go to the next slide, uh, you can see uh, that uh, you need some eyepieces. Uh, you need the different eyepieces, um, give you different uh, magnifications. Uh, so you need a wide field, a low power eyepiece to, to help you find things and then you can zoom in with a higher power. And speaking of zooming, something I like to recommend to a lot of people who are just starting out, buy a, a nice zoom eyepiece. They're more expensive, but you don't have to change eyepieces, you just zoom in and out. And that's kind of a nice feature uh, for, for a beginner. And so those, that's something to consider, a nice Dobsonian telescope. Uh, the smaller ones may run about $200 or so, and the larger ones run three, four, five hundred dollars $500. So you can get a decent telescope for not that much money. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Uh, I appreciate you guys being bright and early to join us uh, for Ask an Astronomer. There's a few things I don't want you to miss. Uh, next week on the 23rd, we have a wonderful Lunch and Learn highlighting our Valentine House with Ulysses uh, Dietz. And then on the 25th, we have a cultural, so local cultural leaders and artists round table. And that's on Saturday, I believe the 25th at 3 p.m. Next week, join us for our science pill at noon. And we'll see you again for Ask an Astronomer in two weeks. So every other week. Again, thank you so much for submitting all your questions. I know we didn't get to some of them. Uh, we try to keep track of all the questions and we'll, and we'll get to them in, in, a, in two weeks. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Jess. Bye, Kevin. Bye.